Hey, good morning. Great to see everyone here today. We are in our third week of Monster Month. Who'd we talk about last week? Count Dracula. I don't have any garlic for you this week because today we will be talking about the invisible man. Who has seen this movie? Who has read this book? Now, my research for this sermon, I decided to read the book by H.G. Wells, 1897, same year as Dracula. Again, spoiler warning, you've had over 100 years to read the book. I'm not giving, it's, it's all right. I also decided to watch the movie, which pretty much followed in line with the book. There were a few differences. The movie is great as well. If you're an Amazon Prime member, it is streaming for free on Amazon Prime. Movie came out, I think, 1933, and it actually, it holds up. I think it's one of my favorite of the classic monster movies that I've seen so far. I uh, highly recommend both the book and the movie of The Invisible Man. Now, there are many, many, and actually Ted goes to me this morning. He says, are we going to have a surprise appearance? Are we going to have a surprise guest appearance by The Invisible Man? Which I say, no, sorry, I can't dress up. And he says, but you can't see him. He may be sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're having too much fun already here. Now, there's many different ways in which we can understand the story of the Invisible Man. Here is the lens through which I want to look at the Invisible Man. Well, first off, let's give a synopsis. It's the story of a scientist who makes himself invisible. And here's the story. Uh, his invisibility, it leaves him isolated. I mean, just think about having... Maybe some of you have invisible friends. I'm not sure about this. Uh, but think about having an invisible friend. It, it's kind of difficult to have a conversation with someone when they're invisible. Or if you're staring at someone who is just a pile of clothes, they don't have a head, you can't see anything else. It's a bit awkward if you've ever tried this before. His invisibility leaves him isolated, which then leads him down a path of crime as he terrorizes a small, peaceful town. It's a nice, quiet village like Dobbs Ferry, like Ardsley, or wherever you live, and all of a sudden the invisible man sweeps into town. The calmness gets upended. He begins going absolutely insane. He starts a bit crazy, a bit insane, but as the story continues, he begins to become even more insane, and he unleashes a reign of terror. Uh, that's what he keeps saying. I'm about to unleash my reign of terror upon the world. And he becomes even more erratic and more unstable as the book, as the movie, as the story continues. Now, here's how I want to look at this story. The Invisible Man is the story about the danger of isolating ourselves from others. And it's about our need for community. I did not want to give this sermon. <laughs> Uh, because I feel like I've been talking about community for I don't know how many weeks in a row now. I feel like every single ser sermon had a component of we need each other, we need community, yet I couldn't get away from this idea. And when I envisioned this sermon, I had no idea what I would find. I really had no clue. I went into this series thinking it'd be a fun idea. Let me explore it. Let me see what comes up. As I was putting the sermon together, The Invisible Man, I had this whole other sermon in mind. I started sketching it out. It just didn't feel right. I came back to this idea about how the invisible man at the heart of the story, it's about the danger of isolating ourselves from others. See, when we first meet the invisible man, he just wants to be left alone. The story begins with a massive snowstorm. He walks into an inn he says, give me a room, give me some food, and then leave me alone. I want to be in a place where I can be by myself in order to do my work. I do not want to be bothered. And then from there, he gets a bit more ornery. The innkeeper's wife brings him food. He says, leave me alone. She goes up there because she forgot to bring him mustard. And he's eating. He doesn't like anyone watching him eat because he's invisible. But yet, before the food gets digested, you can see the food going down his digestive tract. And he doesn't want anyone else to see this. He gets really upset. 
the innkeeper's wife calls the police, tells everyone there's something strange going on up there. As the story progresses, he's been there for a while. He's not paying his rent. He keeps telling her, don't worry, some money is going to come in. He gets more and more upset. And I want to show you a scene. You have waited three weeks for a movie clip, which you probably all thought, if we're doing Monster Month, classic monster movies, there would be a clip week one. I made you wait three weeks for your first monster clip, which means it had better be a good clip. This is a scene where everyone is charging up into the invisible man's room because something weird is going on and the innkeeper wants him out. Yeah, what's all this? Keep back there. Keep back me? Do you know who you're talking to? I give you a last chance to leave me alone. Give me a last chance. You've committed assault, this what you've done, and you can come along to the station with me. Come along now, come quietly, unless you want me to put the handcuffs on. Stop where you are. You don't know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing, all right. Come on. Get hold of him. Lock him up. All right, you fools. You've brought it on yourselves. Everything would have come right if you'd only left me alone. You've driven me near madness with your peering through the keyholes and gaping through the curtains. And now you'll suffer for it. You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? All right, I'll show you. There's a souvenir for you. And one for you. I'll show you who I am and what I am. <laughs> Look. He's all eaten away. Huh? How do you like that, eh? <laughs> yeah, he just wants to be left alone. None of this would have happened if you have just would have left me alone in my room by myself. And as the story continues, uh, here's a good phrase for how the story goes. It's all downhill from here. He keeps getting more and more unstable, more and more erratic because he just wants to be left alone. You ever been there before? You just want to be left alone. Yeah, he's not the only one who has gone down this path before. I think at times we all find ourselves there. We push others away. You ever been there before? You like me? Something is going on in your life, and instead of reaching out to someone else or someone reaches out to you, you say, it's okay. I'm all right. I'm, I'm just going to deal with this on my own. I I'll be okay. Uh, we've all hid parts of ourselves from others. We all do this. We have those skeletons in our closet, the, the, the buckets that we keep tucked away under the bed. We don't want anyone to enter into those areas. We keep them hidden, invisible from other people. You ever lock yourself away? You, you, you bury your heart from other people. You, you've extended your heart, you've shown love, and then you've been burned before. And so you say, well, I'm just... I'm going to bury my heart away. I'm going to keep it closed off. I'm not going to allow others to access that part of who I am because I've been hurt and, and I've been burned. Yeah, it's the story of the invisible man, but it's the story of all of us. It's the story of being human. We all find ourselves there from time to time. And there's a story that I think beautifully illustrates this idea and shows what happens when we walk down this path. It's a story of someone by the name of King David. If you have been in church for any period of time, chances are you have probably heard of King David before. If you haven't been in church, you have probably heard of King David. And here's a King David story, probably one of his top five stories, not in a good light, but yet it's still one of the stories that he's well known for. It takes place in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Uh, who's heard of the story of David and Bathsheba? Here's how the story begins. 
In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Two phrases here, which are immensely important for understanding isolation and how or what happens when we isolate ourselves. First phrase, at the time when kings go off to war. This story begins, the narrator tells us, this is when the kings go off to war. In the spring, every single March, just like daylight savings time, you put it on your calendar, it happens. The kings go off to war. What does David do? He sends everyone out. He sends everyone off to war. And then here's our second phrase. But David remained in Jerusalem. The narrator is telling us, you, you, you know the time, March 15th, when everyone goes off to war? The kings, every year, they head off with their men in order to attack other cities, other people. Yeah, this is that time. And David sends everyone out, but what does he do? He remains in Jerusalem. David is isolating himself from others. He's sending everyone away, and now he is left alone in his palace. Probably a couple servants as well. Where does this lead? It leads here. Sketch artist from uh, 4,000 years ago. <laughs> King David, all alone, he's bored. He has nothing to do. All of his closest allies, closest friends are off fighting somewhere in a distant city. He stands atop his palace, overlooking his kingdom, and he sees a bathing beauty. He says, I want her. So he grabs some servants. He says, bring her to my palace. Bring her to my house. He sleeps with her. She becomes pregnant. Then David has to somehow fix the situation. He says, her husband is off at war. Bring him back here so I can wine and dine him and he can spend a night with his wife. Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, comes back and says, I can't do this. I can't have wine. I can't have fine food. I can't spend the night with my wife while all of my friends, my allies, are off fighting in a war. <laughs> Who's the more moral of the two in this story here? Yeah, you're like, there's no way. So he sleeps actually outside the doorway of his house so that no one can say anything about what he was doing in Jerusalem when he was back home. He goes back off, doesn't spend any time with his wife. He goes back off, fights, war, fights the war. David says, I got to figure something else out. He tells his commander, send Uriah to the front of the line. Basically, ensure that he gets killed. Ensure that he dies in battle. His commander does this. Uriah is in the front of the line. The fighting is heavy. Uriah dies. David takes Bathsheba as his wife. It all began with isolation. By David remaining in Jerusalem while everyone else is off fighting in war. Who does David look a lot like in this story? He looks a lot like the invisible man. Removing himself from others, removing himself from society, using his power in a way that who cares about the consequences. Here's how the invisible man says it. Practically, I thought I had impunity to do whatever I chose. Didn't care about anyone else. Everything, save to give my secret away. Can't let anyone know that I am the invisible man. So I thought, Whatever I did, whatever the consequences might be, was nothing to me. I had merely to fling aside my garments and vanish. No person could hold me. This is what David is thinking as well. He's thinking the, the consequences. Who cares about the consequences? Who cares about the harm that I cause? Who cares about the families that I disrupt? Who cares about whose life gets thrown upside down, or who dies in the process. It all started because he began closing his heart off to other people. 
sending everyone else away when it was his responsibility, his role to be a part of the community. And he said, you know what? I am going to remain at arm's length from everyone else, and I am going to remain here in Jerusalem. This is what happens when we isolate ourselves from others. Our hearts become callous to the needs of those around us. We begin to think solely about ourselves, what we need, what we want. And yes, you need to protect yourself, of course. But you can't protect yourself at the expense of closing everyone else off from your life. Basically, what the Invisible Man and what David are saying here, three things, saying, I I don't need anyone else. When we isolate ourselves from others, this is what we're saying. I I don't need anyone else. We're saying, I have enough strength to get through this on my own. Whatever I'm facing, whatever I'm going through, I have the power within me to get through this by myself without anyone else. Or, I'm better on my own. Have you ever uttered this phrase before? I'm better on my own. I don't need their help. I don't need their pity, their mercy. I can do this on my own strength. Now, as the story continues in The Invisible Man, he begins to realize that this way of living is folly. He thought he could do it by himself. He thought he wouldn't care about the consequences. But as the story goes on, what you begin to discover is that he feels the need to have a companion. He feels the need to have someone share his life with him. And so he says this. He says, talking to another scientist by the name of Kemp, I made a mistake, Kemp, a huge mistake in carrying this thing through alone. I thought I could do it by myself, but in reality, I made a giant mistake because I can't carry this by myself. This is too big. This is too much. I I thought on my own I had the strength to carry it, but now as I'm walking this path, I'm beginning to realize that I, I, I just really can't do it on my own. I have wasted strength, time, opportunities. And here maybe might be the most famous quote of the entire book, alone. It is wonderful how little a man can do. I love that quote. That one sentence alone. Yeah, it's wonderful how little you can do by yourself. <laughs> yeah, by yourself? Not so much. But with a confederate, with a companion, with a friend, with an ally, and of course, food and rest, because we all need those, a thousand things are possible. Ooh, there's so much wisdom there. Yeah, alone. It's crazy how little you can do, how little you can accomplish with a friend, with another, someone that you can trust. A thousand things are possible. The world becomes your oyster. (laughs) Here's a picture of Caesarea Maritima in Israel. And I was in Israel probably about 13, 14 years ago. The first day that I was there, extremely jet lagged, woke up in the morning and we were touring around. We go to this site and I was sitting on one of these stands right here, overlooking the ocean. My Hebrew professor told us something so profound, I nearly fell down all of those steps into the stadium below. (laughs) I'll never forget this day because what he said was so mind-blowing, it changed so much about how I see things, how I see the Bible, how I see God, how I see community. Here's what he said. He said, in the Hebrew consciousness, sin wasn't so much about moral categories, but sin happens when you isolate yourselves from others. We, we like to think sin is this action, and it's this action, and doing this, and harming this person. And and yes, that is true, but according to the Hebrew worldview, it begins when you start isolating yourself from other people. 
when you remove yourself from community, when you hide yourself away from other people, when you push others and keep them at arm's length. Isolation is sin. Salvation, how are we saved? How are we rescued? How are we made whole again? Connectedness with others. Think about Jesus in the book of John. He likens himself to a tree. And we're to stay connected to that tree. Well, that that tree has many branches. I don't know many trees that simply have, besides maybe like a Charlie Brown tree that has one branch. There's multitudes of branches because we're all connected together. Jesus is the, the tree, but yet all these branches, it's all of us connected together. Sin happens when we isolate ourselves. We are made whole again as we connect with others as we allow others into our lives, as we share our life with other people. Uh, That's why uh, the book of Leviticus, probably everyone's least favorite book of the Bible, because it has all those rules, regulations. You read about a chapter or two, you're all pumped up, and you realize, oh my goodness, I'm never going to make it to the end of this book. Why is it in there? Because it's about, well, how do we live in harmony with each other? All these rules, these regulations, these laws, they seem boring, but they're actually really, really important because they teach us how do we create a society where everyone is accepted, where everyone is loved, where everyone is made whole through sharing life with other people. That's why that book is in there because the Israelites, they're they're trying to figure the whole thing out. They were just slaves. They were told what to do, and now God is offering them a picture This is how you become free, true men and women, human beings. Here's how you create a society that leads to salvation and wholeness for all people and doesn't fracture, doesn't create disharmony. Yeah, you you learn to live together, connected. When I heard this, it, it changed everything because we think sin is the action, but it actually begins when we start burying our hearts and closing our hearts off from other people. We are made whole through connectedness with others. And I have four stories to share with you about my experience with this. First, sitting in an office. I spend a lot of time in my office. I write things. I work on things. When I am in my office for a long period of time and I have not seen another person, something inside me feels off. Have you ever had this experience before? Something feels off. I realize I'm not meant to be all alone, by myself, in an office, disconnected from other people. There is a time and place for it, yes. I have things that have to get done, things that I need to do alone, without other people talking to me. But I can only do that for so long. And so I'm very intentional about making sure then that I make time for other people. Whether I try to get together with someone, make a phone call, walk downstairs and go see one of the other pastors at the church where I work at, whatever it is, I can't sit alone in my office all day by myself without feeling the negative effects of that. It's how we're all wired. Yeah, we need our alone time, some of us more than others, of course. But We're not meant to do that 24-7. We need companionship. Second story. I have a really, really good friend. One day he emails me. He says, hey, I'm struggling with some things. I'm going through some things. Can we talk once a week? Because I need a little bit of accountability. And he's really funny because he, uh, he has a disclaimer. He says, you know, not that accountability crap that you hear about in youth group when you're really young. (laughs) But I need like that real human brother-to-brother accountability where I need someone else that I can share what I'm going through, the struggles that I have, and I can have someone who can listen and help me walk through this and, this is really important, overcome it. Because he says, I can't do this on my own. 
I need someone that I can trust. Yeah, on his own, isolating himself, he never would be able to overcome the thing that he's facing. So he's realizing he's reaching out because he realizes I need someone's help. Another story, I have another friend. He sent me a message and says, hey, can we talk on a regular basis? Because I feel like we are going through some of the same struggles. Some of the things that you're facing in life, well, I feel like I'm facing those as well. And so can we just share our experiences together? Can we talk about what we're going through and I can hear your story and what's helping you and you can hear my story and what's helping me? Yeah, that's how it's meant to be. That's how life works. You, you find other people that are in the same places where you are. You share what you're experiencing. You listen to their story. And then together, you help each other. <laughs> Sin, isolation, salvation, connectedness. I'll add one more story here. Uh, I, I know I have one here. I'm going to add a fifth one. I have another friend, and uh, he just finished up a, uh, an addiction program. And he tells me about this whole experience in the program and how he's doing since he's been in this program. He says, you know what's really, really difficult? You know what's really hard in trying to stay sober? It's the times when I'm by myself. It's the times when I'm alone. And if I have a weekend to myself, it's really not good for me. And he said, can, can I call you at those times when I, when I feel a pull to that which I'm trying to leave behind? And of course, yeah, send me a message. Let's get on the phone. I don't want you to feel like you have to walk through it by yourself. Sin is isolation. Salvation is found in connectedness. And then I have one final story. Uh, for me, uh, when I was in college, I lost my best friend. My initial response was to push everyone away because I was grieving. I was hurting. And I didn't want anyone else, whether to, to see me in that state or I didn't feel like I wanted anyone else to enter into that which I was experiencing. And so I pushed people away for a time. But I have great friends uh, who are still great friends, and they wouldn't let me be by myself. <laughs> they kept pushing. They kept initiating, hey, let's go out here. Let's go have dinner. Let's go, have, let's go watch a movie. Let's go do this. And through their love, their constant, hey, let's get together, I began to walk through the grieving process. If I had stayed sequestered in my room by myself, I don't know what would have happened, but I had people who were there with me. They gave me space when I needed my space because when you're grieving, you, you need that space. Yeah, definitely. And so they, they allowed me to have that space, but they wouldn't allow me to stay there. And they kept looking for opportunities. Hey, let's get together. And I began to find healing through the love of others who cared about me. And they're some of my greatest friends still today. Yeah, isolation. It's not who we're meant to be. Salvation, wholeness, it's found in connectedness with others. Alone, it's wonderful how little you can do. <laughs> it's amazing how little you can accomplish. But with a confederate, I think we should start using that word, although it could cause some issues, I see now, thinking about that. <laughs> with, with a companion, with a friend, a trusted friend. Man, it's amazing what you can accomplish. Here's the story of David. Here's how it ends. The Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to David. And when he came to him, he said, Nathan gives this whole parable about this person who, uh, this rich and powerful person who stole something from the little person. And David responds, he says, that man must be punished using his power in a way that robs from the little people. To which Nathan says, uh, David, you are that man. You are the rich ruler who's been robbing from the little person. And then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Question for you this morning. Who is your Nathan? Who is your Nathan? Who is your trusted confederate? 
your trusted companion, the one who helps to restore you. I've had many Nathans in my life. People with the name Nathan, yes, and people who act as a Nathan as well. You know what they do for me? They help me see where I'm off the mark. Hey, Dave. No. (laughs) You know you have a good friend when they just look at you and shake their head in just one word. No. No. They help keep me humble. They help me realize that life isn't all about me. And there's billions of other people out there. Life isn't just all about me. My Nathans help me to see this. They keep me humble and they keep me sane. Invisible man, the more time he spent in isolation, the more time he spent by himself, the more unstable and insane he became. And I do not want to look like this. I'm sure you do not want to look like this. I love The Invisible Man, the book, because there's a, it's like a a Marvel mid credit scene. And I actually toyed with the idea of having Keaton come up and then doing a mid, an end credit scene here for a sermon. (laughs) Then I thought you would all be like, wait, what's going on here? And you'd be really confused. Uh, So I see half of you are shaking your head no. The other half are saying that would have been brilliant. I don't know which side, but I decided we'll end the sermon with the mid credit scene. At the, in the epilogue, after the Invisible Man has left, uh, he's not terrorizing the town anymore, he has left his books that explains how he became invisible. And the innkeeper knows where the books are. The innkeeper is the only person who knows where these books are. So the innkeeper decides that he is going to lock the books away so that no one else has access to the books. What do you think the innkeeper does with the books? Here's what we're told in the epilogue. Oh, here he is, the innkeeper, by the fire. He decides to do this. On Sunday mornings, Every Sunday morning, instead of going to Awaken Church, all the year round, while he is closed to the outer world, and every night after 10. Notice that phrase, closed to the outer world. You ever close yourself off to the outer world? He goes into his bar parlor, bearing a glass of gin, faintly, ever so faintly, tinged with water. And having placed this down, he locks the door, examines the blinds, and even looks under the table. And then being satisfied of his solitude, his aloneness, he unlocks the cupboard and a box in the cupboard and a drawer in the box and produces three volumes bound in brown leather. What's he doing? He's by himself. He's alone. We saw where that led the invisible man. His books, his science experiments, isolating himself from other people. What is this innkeeper doing now? Locking all the doors. In the aloneness, in the solitude, in the isolation, he's pouring over these books. And the story ends. I wouldn't do what he did. I'd just... Well, yeah, it's a warning. It's a warning. It's a warning for all of us. We're made whole through connectedness with others, not through the countless other ways that we attempt to find wholeness. Yeah, and the invisible man ends with a warning. You saw what isolation did for him. You saw what isolation does for us as humans, and yet here's someone else playing with fire, walking the same path. Don't close yourself off to others. Don't push away the love that others have for you. Seek it out. Be a person of love for other people. I got a text last night from Lynn. She's telling me how difficult of a time it's been for her. Yet she added this, I can't tell you how thankful I am 
for the cards that the church is sending me. It could be easy for her going through all these negative health episodes to isolate herself. Here we are as a church sending love, saying we don't want you to feel isolated because that can lead down a dark path. We want you to know that you're loved, that we're thinking of you. Same message that we received from Nicole and Trish. Hey, it's been really, really difficult. It's been really hard, but your prayers, your cards, it's giving us strength. It's the power of community, alone. It's wonderful how little you can do, but together, healing is possible. Together, we can overcome our struggles. We can overcome the darkness that we all go through.